Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome to Jude 11b. <laughs> Last week we looked at woes. Uh, today we're going to look at the way of Cain, whatever that is. Hopefully we'll figure it out by the end of the sermon. Uh, evil Cain kills righteous Abel. Um, that comes from some verses that refer to them in the New Testament. So when we looked at woes, we saw it was pain, suffering, regret, things that you really don't want to happen. And the, them are the false teachers. Uh, they're believers who don't teach God's truth accurately and particularly deny Christ's lordship. So as we look at Cain, we're going to see how he does not respond properly to uh, the Lord in obedience and submission and the problems that that winds up causing. I, I really like Genesis chapter 4, which is the story of Cain and Abel. Um, not because of sibling rivalry, but because this is the first chapter of what life on our planet is like outside the Garden of Eden. So in this, you would expect to find some really significant themes. And what you know, looks just like the first murder, um, although you could claim Satan murdered them, uh, implicated as accessory to their murder in uh, Genesis 3. Uh, you, you have really a chapter on worship believe it or not. So the chapter begins and ends with uh, some references to worship. And within it, you see that uh, Cain is not responding properly to God's revelation on a number of levels, uh, both in terms of the worth of God and the reproof of God. Um, while uh, Abel, who is considered righteous, doing what's right in God's sight, does, you also have some insight into what righteousness is all about. And it's not about Jesus dying for your sins, although um, it might be part of it, because uh, you know you just have a few people, and there's no mention of the cross, no mention of the blood, or anything like that. So we're going to take a look at righteousness. We're going to talk talk about how to um, master sin before it masters us. Okay, so woe to them, for they've gone in the way of Cain. That's what we're going to look at today have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, which we'll look at next week, and perished in the rebellion of Korah, which will probably be the week thereafter. So, uh, back in chapter 2, Abel was the keeper of the sheep, um, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. So we got the old um, clash between the herdsmen and the ranchers, um, or the farmers. So, as you know, Cain uh, offered a sacrifice, and God didn't accept it, and it causes all kinds of problems. So, worship is a response to revelation. We have to respond to what God has revealed. And uh, we don't have a real record of God saying you have to offer a blood sacrifice. So why does God not accept Abel's offering? Well, the answer will eventually come up. Um, as Lord of life, God desires and is worthy of our very lives. Not our surplus, nor our leftovers. In the last book of the Old Testament, uh, faults God's people for giving him the leftovers. He says, you wouldn't even offer that for your taxes. How can you offer it to me? So, uh, Abel offers a sacrifice that uh, shows that God is worthy of lives, while Cain doesn't. And uh, this was written by Moses somewhere after probably Mount Sinai. And uh, 30 days after the initial appearance on Mount Sinai, he writes Leviticus. And in there, the sacrifice is spelled out. It's got to be blood. So his original audience... Uh, would have understood this, but did Cain really understand that or not? Let's kind of take a look and see what, how the story unfolds. Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. So, first, fat firstborn from the flock. And uh, the Lord looked with favor, respected Abel and his offering. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell, and he had a franny face. 
Okay, so let's take a look at one little thing here. Um, one brings the fruit, produce. One brings the firstborn of his flock. Uh, which is more valuable? Firstborn of the flock. Um, you know, fruit is given by almost every pagan religion. You know, if you ever see a picture of a temple somewhere, they're you know, offering fruit or flowers. It's a nice little thing to have, and uh, you know, it keeps the uh, false priest in fruit cocktail or whatever. Um, and it's particularly helpful if you're a vegetarian kind of thing. But there's a little verb tense in here that most people miss. Imperfect versus perfect. And in the Hebrew, imperfect means it's an ongoing thing. Perfect is really just a until your one time act. So uh, God really uh, regards with favor Abel and his offering as an ongoing thing, but he didn't like what Cain did. And he basically tells Cain he needs to do differently. Uh, before we get to that, let's take a look at what Hebrews 11.4 says. Um, it talks about the people who believe that God is who he said he is and will do what he said he'll do. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith you can't please God because you must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. He is who he said he is or who he's revealed himself to be. And Cain recognizes that in his sacrifice, that he's the Lord of life. Uh, Abel, eh. I mean, Cain, yeah. Abel, yeah. You know which one. Uh, details. Um, Abel recognizes he's the Lord of life. Cain doesn't. So in recognizing who God is, Abel offers to him a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did, through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And the next person that they mention is, um, after Abel got killed, God provided Seth, and uh, we have his great-great-great-grandson, uh, who walks with, I mean, they call upon God, and then his descendant, who walks with God, Enoch. So, um, God is testifying that he is righteous and he's pleased with them. And then you get into Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and you know, Moses and all the other people. So I want you to notice a couple things here. Um, God testifies that he was righteous um, because he offered a more excellent sacrifice. It doesn't say it's a blood sacrifice that does it, but just the fact that he offered God his best. And God was pleased with that. Righteousness comes from what he does, testifying of the gift that he gave, not necessarily his belief. Righteousness is doing what's right in God's sight, not believing what's right in God's sight, but doing what is right in God's sight. And I think a lot of people miss this element, which is the dominant element uh, of meaning of righteousness throughout the, the scriptures. Um, and yes, there is righteousness that comes through faith. Totally by that Romans 4. Um, but here, we don't have Romans 4. We just have Genesis 4. So, the Lord said to Cain, uh, Dude, why are you angry? And why do you have the friendly face? So, Cain got really angry that God did not accept the sacrifice. How do we know that God did not accept it? We're not told. But there's like half a dozen verses that talk about God bringing fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifice that gets offered. And it's, you know, likely that that happened. So, uh, you know, the uh, sheep got barbecued and the fruit didn't. So uh, maybe that's one of the ways that God showed he liked it. Remember with Elijah, fire calls down fire and burns up his sacrifice. And then uh, not that of the folks of Baal. But notice that God is seeking understanding, not just doing. Um, why are you angry? He doesn't just say, Cain, offer a different sacrifice. Give me what I want. But he wants us to have insight into why we do what we do 
so we can grow through the process. And his denial of Cain's sacrifice is not just to get him upset, but to have him do what is right. Anger is often a response to hurt or loss. Um, you get angry at God eventually in the stages of grief. You get angry when you get hurt. Um, the adrenaline pumps up and uh, you basically are mad. And he says to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? I always throw those two verses together. And of course, Jonah said, oh yeah, sure I do. <laughs> but not so. Uh, and then God shows him that he's uh, wrong later in the book of Jonah. The other thing that we see him demonstrating is jealousy. And jealousy stems from a sense of inferiority because we think we don't have or aren't what we think is vital. So he didn't have God's approval, and he kind of needed that, and therefore he hates uh, Abel because Abel did what was right, and Cain didn't. So God doesn't want just outward conformity. He wants inner uh, transformation. And of course, uh, Cain fails at that. Uh, 1 John 3, uh, uh, 1 John is just a great book. Um, you, you never get to it because it's like, you know, stuck way near at the end. And, you know, it's like all these other books, you know, Romans and Corinthians and all that other stuff in front of it. Um, but, and it's difficult to understand because it looks like he keeps repeating himself. And he does emphasize that you are supposed to love your brother. That's the command. The greatest command that uh, after love God is love your brother. And to love someone was to have a relationship with them. To hate them was to not have a relationship with them, as you see in Malachi. Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. God chose to have a relationship with the descendants of Jacob, not with the descendants of Esau. So John writes, uh, let no one deceive you, and people are deceived on this. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Oh, I thought it was just he who believed in Jesus is righteous. Well, you better take that up with 1 John. Because uh, this gets repeated many times. Uh, you're righteous as God is righteous. You're like demonstrating Christ-like behavior, loving others, laying down your life for others. No greater love has anyone that has laid down their life for their friends. And then the next verse... Oops, sorry. It says, he who sins, and one of the themes in First John is, um, if you know God, you don't keep on sinning. And it doesn't say you don't have your sins forgiven, it just says you don't keep on sinning. He who sins is of the devil, and the word for sin here is misses the mark. I think a lot of people look at this and say, oh, it's just transgression, so I don't do any of the you know, violations of the Ten Commandments. Well, yeah, you don't do the sins of commission, but you do the sins of omission. And your motivations are sourced in believing the devil's lies, who is a liar from the beginning. Uh, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. You don't do what the devil wants you to do. And he gets a little more explicit. If you do not practice righteousness, you're not of God. Okay, that's true. Nor is he who does not love his brother. So the thing that is motivating people who do not practice righteousness and the thing that is motivating um, those who do not love their brother is the thinking and philosophy of the devil. They're believing the devil's lies. Is that powerful? Sourced in? Sourced in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sourced in the devil, uh, the father of lies, who basically missed the mark from the beginning. So you're missing the mark that God has set out for you, and that actually is bad. Um, this is the command that we have, we should love one another, so everybody agrees with that. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, the devil, and murdered his brother. So uh, you know, I looked up, why, how do the Jews deal with this? For this passage, and uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. Um, some of them said that uh, his father was the devil, um, and they didn't even have the New Testament. But verse one of chapter four says Adam knew his uh, wife Eve and gave birth to uh, Cain. So, like, 
<laughs> even back then you have people teaching who don't look at what the scriptures say. Uh, another one said that they argued over a woman. So uh, Adam and Eve had other children, obviously, and they had daughters, and it was a pretty one, and uh, Abel uh, wanted her, and Cain wanted her, and they fought over it. You know, that's it's, it's about the sacrifice, folks. It's not about that. In fact, we aren't even told that Adam and Eve had other kids until Seth was born. And then, of course, they had a whole bunch more. Someone said they argued over uh, theology. Yeah, so, so, you know, people are just so stuck in their ivory towers, they don't realize that the text says it was because God accepted one over the other. It's jealousy. He wanted God's approval. And we're going to see that he's trying to, that, that the, his whole line is they're not getting approval from the right source for doing the right thing. Correct. Uh -huh. So wisdom is the right objective and the right means of obtaining the objective. And I think Cain, you know, basically is offering worship, but he's offering God the leftovers. So he wanted God's approval. Normally you worship the gods for blessing. He wants God's blessing. Uh, someone else in the Jews said, uh, you know, they're arguing over inheritance rights of the earth. You know, it's just, uh, it's just his worth and value take a hit. And he kills his brother because his works were evil. Now, it's not the murdering him that's evil. Why did he murder him? Because he murdered him. No, it's not saying that. <laughs> he murdered him because his works... Offering God less than the best was considered evil. And then we're going to see not responding to God was evil. And his brother's works were righteous. So it's in the offering, and the offering is a, the outward is a reflection of the inward. And then we have these words that people don't, you know, we just don't listen to them. He who does not love his brother abides in death and whoever hates his brother is a murderer wow and does not have eternal life abiding in him most of us would never think of killing someone um, but we would think of not wanting a relationship with someone and you know and all kinds of other things. So Abel um, was righteous. Cain, by comparison, is unrighteous. And his solution is to eliminate the competition. Now, if you think about it, so far we only know for sure there are four people on the earth. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it was switched around, Abel would have maybe bought a sheep to be able to offer to show that God is worthy of life. Was there any two, two things, yeah. It's There's probably revelation. But even without that, going back to Hebrews 11, uh, Abel figured out that God was the God of life and worthy of life. And then the offering was a token of his own life, that he's giving his life. Abel just gives a part of him, but Cain just gives a part of himself, and not all of himself. So fruit is just a part, you know, it's just it's part of me, but it's not me. And that's why God had respect to Abel, and his offering did not have respect to Cain and his offering. So it's the person, and then what they do. So uh, Abel is putting his life into his offering. Cable is just putting some of his efforts. In life, yeah. So when God, I mean, they had the Adam and Eve, and they had the fact that God made skin offerings for them, and that fig leaves were not accepted. It's also the piece that the earth was cursed. So Cain is actually offering a cursed offering to God, which was not what God wanted. Now, when, when you get to you know, the requirements of Exodus and Leviticus. Um, there are grain offerings, there are fruit of the vine offerings, you know, there is other stuff. But the centerpiece of all the offerings to God were blood because that's where the life was. And I've given you, life is in the blood. And that goes back to the Yeah. They have to offer 
they needed some to cover it, but that's reading a lot into the. Oh, well, well, we had to, they had Adam and Eve. They were the parents. So uh, the piece that I want to help you see out of in reference to these guys that failure to look for your life to God in your service of others is actually a form of hate. You're not loving. And you are remaining in the realm of lack of dominion and death. And you do not have life of the age abiding in him, says John. You're missing out on the eternal future. Really significant. And if you read through First John, um, this becomes like abundantly clear that it's you need to love one another, have fellowship with one another in order to have fellowship with God. So that leads to Cain was looking for worth and value. And worth and value come from doing what's right in God's sight. That's righteousness. Being blessable in God's sight on his terms. And worship today is not about God. It's about how you feel, what you want. Um, the Jews have kind of totally thrown out what God said uh, about a blood sacrifice. Because they don't have a temple to do it anymore. And they said, oh, do good works so that makes up for it. You know, give money and makes up for it, which is the world's view. That's not God's view. God requires life. And unless your sins are covered by Jesus' death, you're still in them. So doing what's right in God's sight, righteousness, worth of value come from that. And I love verse 7. He says to Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Uh there are different ways. The word can mean exalted, um, but NIV and a lot of them, translations, most of them now, use accepted. And a lot of the you know, bad translations talk about you'll be exalted um, instead of having a cast down face. You'll have a happy face. Well, yeah, but the whole big thing is, is your sacrifice and what you offer God acceptable in his sight? If you want it to be accepted, you need to do well. Uh, yeah, there might be some belief in it of what God's worthy of, but God does judge us on our works. And our works have to come from a pure heart. Love of, from God is unconditional. He loves the whole world. He, he wants what's best for them. But acceptance and blessing are conditional. And this is something most modern evangelical teachers, as well as you know, anyone who's mainstream, totally miss. Love's unconditional, but acceptance and blessing are always conditional. And that is shown by God's dealing with the nation of Israel, which most people are ignorant of. And it's also shown by Jesus' explicit teaching and his practice. Who were the people who had fellowship with Jesus during his time on earth? Only those who followed him. He went to the next town. You couldn't just like live stream Jesus' next miracle. It wasn't there. You had to go with him, and people had to make a sacrifice of their lives. We left everything to follow you. And then Jesus says, hey, I'll make it up to you. You won't regret it. A couple of verses on that. Um, the blessing and cursing section out of Deuteronomy. These are God's redeemed people. All right, These are the people who came out of Egypt and then had to wander 40 years in the desert because their parents disobeyed. And then he says, and these are you know, always worth Every year I kind of go back to these. If you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, diligently obey, purposefully obey, mindfully obey the voice of the Lord your God so that you observe carefully all his commandments, then the Lord will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you. They'll chase after you and overtake you. Why? Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And if you don't obey, then all these curses will come upon you. The blessing of God is dependent upon obedience. Jesus said in multiple times, If anyone does not abide or remain in me, and as it's going to say in the next verse, and God's words in him, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. 1 Corinthians 3, smoky Christians. 
Um, they don't have any you know, fruit, nothing that glorifies God, no reward. Uh, reference bikini believers before the bima or the naked ones uh, as well. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You remain, abide, draw your strength from me, and my words are actively in your life, in your you know, life stream. And ask what you desire, and it shall be done. You have a relationship where God answers your prayers. John 14, 21, he who has my commands and keeps them, he is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and will manifest myself to him. Thomas asks a question, and then God, uh, Jesus re iterates it. You also have the same theme in 1 John. If you skim through it this week, you'll find it. So, you want to be accepted? Do what's right. You want to be rejected? Don't do what's right. It is your choice. Right? If you have a choice. Now, Cain doesn't listen to the voice of God. God is reproving him or bringing things to light. And Cain doesn't pay attention. It wasn't his sacrifice. It was Cain and his heart. And God goes on to say, if you do not do well, if you do well, you'll be accepted. Next part of the verse. If you do not do well, sin crouches like a lion, that's what the word's used for, at the door. And its desire is to have you for lunch. But you should, actually, must is a better translation. I've changed it on your outline. Must rule over it. Now, this is the same word that was used in the previous chapter when Eve is reaping judgment for her sin. And part of it, Adam basically gets the curse. The ground is going to be difficult. It's not going to, you're going to just earn your, get your fruit by the, or your food by the sweat of your brow. Um, and for Eve, your, you know, pain in childbirth, your desire shall be for your husband. Oh, my husband. I don't think it's that. It's your, your desire shall be to rule over your husband, just like chapter 4 talks about, verse 7. And instead, he is going to rule over you. And you know, just look at, you know, concept of marriage for the ages. You look at almost every couple you see walking down the street. The wife wants to rule over the husband. Yeah, you know, it's like so clear. And they really don't like the fact that they have to do that. Um, but God had put the husband uh, to rule over the wife. So we must master sin, or it will master us. And we sung a song earlier today, Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's how you master sin. You trust that what God said is correct, and will give you the grace you need to obey, and then you obey. It's, God expects us to obey. If you want to be accepted, do what's right. Yes. Yes. Um, let's go back to number two. So, righteousness is um, doing what's right in God's sight, and it is uh, prompted by the Spirit of God. Self-centeredness versus other-centeredness is, is like the thing. Uh, Self-centeredness focused on self, other-centeredness focuses on others. When you're only looking at yourself and what you want, and you see someone else in the way, you just drive right over them. You don't, you know, so you, you kill them. If, if they are standing in the way of you and your desires, uh, you'll murder them if need be to get what you want. And if they make you feel bad, whoa, look out. And our, our culture basically, because people have no emotional control, has, has gotten to this point. I know, getting down to that down here. Paul addresses this. Uh, there's a really, I think, decent sermon outline called Ain't Gonna Rain No More on Truth Base. It really tells you how to uh, basically master sin. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Paul does say that we need to reckon or consider, count ourselves dead to sin but alive to God in our union with Christ Jesus, our Lord, 
who the false teachers were denying. Therefore, your responsibility, do not let sin reign, rule, master your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. So personify sin as a master, but and its lusts basically are ours. And those de desires that are evil come from Satan's his world. And we must not let sin and the wrong thinking dominate our actions. Do not, verse 13 says, present your members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but, here's the rest of this, present or yield yourself to God. So the word for present and the word for yield, same word. So we're, we're in Romans 12, 1 and 2. We need to kind of put ourselves on the altar, sacrifice what we want for what God wants, and then eventually God gives us what's best. Here's the reason you should do that. Do you not know that to whom you yield yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey? If you obey sin, you become its slave. And you really no longer have a will of your own. The chains of your desires have, you know, basically prevent you from being righteous. And the consequence, if you're obeying sin, that leads to death. But if you are basically a slave of obedience, it leads to being right in God's sight. This is written to people who already believe that Jesus died for their sins. And in one sense, for righteous with regard to justification, not going to the lake of fire. But now, he tells these believers that have faith in Rome that you need to yield yourself to righteousness, obedience. Otherwise, you lose. But now, past tense, having been set free from sin, we don't have to obey it. And having become slaves of God, and I think a lot of people have not made that decision, you have the fruit of that mindset and actions, which results in holiness. And the end of holiness is eternal life. Of the age, dominion, eternal life. So notice, it's not something that's automatically given to you because you believe that Jesus died for your sins. You have to do something. And notice the progression. You're free from sin, slave of God. The fruit that comes out of your life is holiness. And holiness is necessary for being a partaker of the divine nature and getting eternal life. God is infinitely just. He's not going to give rulership and dominion and power and happy ever after to those who uh, don't listen to his voice. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, almost all of you know that. That's, you know, by the mercies of God, present yourself as a living, ongoing, daily sacrifice to God. That's your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may experience God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. Same thing in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4. You put off, you renew, and you put on. You cannot be renewed until you put off. You stop playing in the mud. And it's like you have a really dirty, sweaty, smelly t-shirt. And you just say, oh, I'm going to put my Christian t-shirt on over it. And I'll be all nice and fragrant. Aroma of Christ. No, you still got the aroma of you, and it stinks. You need to take it off. And then you need to get cleaned up. And it's the thinking in your mind that needs to get cleaned up. Then you can put on Christ, the new righteousness. Second Peter 1, 3 says, you know, God's called us to glory and virtue. Uh, he wants us to be partakers of his divine nature, uh, by which the knowledge of him and the glory and virtue, I believe, up above, have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these you may become partakers of the divine nature. You can become like Jesus. And there's so many false things that says, you are gods. It's a half-truth. You're not automatically gods. You have to do something to become gods or become like God. Remember Satan's temptation to Eve? He knows you'll become like God. Yeah, that is God's plan. His temptations of Jesus were actually things that were true. And remember, Satan's will for our lives is a shortcut. 
And basically it's a short circuit because we really don't get, even in this life, the stuff that uh, God wants us to have. So you may become a partaker of divine nature, but look at the requirement. You have to have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Our desires are deadly. They kill us. You really need to examine your desires. And that's what Cain needed to do. He needed to figure out why did he, why was he angry? And what was, what should he have desired? He wanted God's approval. Great. How do you get it? God told him. Believe in Jesus. No, he didn't say that. He said you have to do what's right if you want to be accepted. Next verse. Should be pretty. Next verse. Therefore, add to your faith which they already had, first thing, virtue, arete, excellence, moral virtue, is somehow some of the translators do it, and then knowledge and you know other things, then the, the capstone of that is brotherly love. Uh, it's something that you have to, giving all diligence, add some stuff to your faith. So it's not faith alone <laughs> that gets you to happily ever, ever after, it's faith and obedience. And it's a process of obedience that he outlines in 1 Peter chapter 1 and in 2 Peter chapter 1. And then you get the rich welcome into the future. So Cain, boy, he rejects reproof. And God is trying to bring to light. Why are you angry? He wants to bring it to light so he can deal with it. When he rejects it, he moves further into the dark. That's axiomatic. And it's always true that when you move away from the light, you're moving into the dark. And when you're in the dark, you don't see things clearly. You can't find the path. And he does it, but which is kind of like we do, covering up by deceit and lying, as well as distorted thinking and values. Gee, who's the father of deceit and lies? Ah, Cain was of the devil, the father of deceit and lies. So Cain, who had just been told, if you, want to, if you want to get accepted, do what's right, and warned that sin is going to try to master you, and it will eat you if you don't master it, fails. So he talked with his Abel, his brother. And then, uh, I think the NIV says he talked to him, so let's go to the field. He wants to be kind of away from Adam and Eve. There's no one around. Um, by now, maybe there were other kids. Yeah, I think so. Um, no, that's a little yeah, hard, what I just said earlier. Um, we don't have the whole story. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. And it's like they were sitting there and he rose up uh, anger and killed him. All right, so it was premeditated, gets him out in the field and kills him. The Jews say that uh, some crows or something came by and taught him how to bury the body. You know, it's like, right. <laughs> um, he had stats of the body behind a bush where he thinks it's going to be hidden from God. And then the Lord said to Cain, um, Hey, Cain, uh, where's Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. So, he knew where he was. This is like God told asked Adam, Adam, where are you? Shh, Eve, don't tell him we're behind these bushes. <laughs> he wants to bring him to awareness of where he is. And uh, am I my brother's keeper? Yeah, you are. Uh, the original audience would know that uh, if the eldest brother had a responsibility for protecting the younger members of the family. And the rulership of the family would go to him when the patriarch died. So faulted on both things. He lies and then he's basically changing he's got distorted values. Oh I'm not responsible for anybody. Well yes you are. And you actually want worth and value and you get it from performing correctly, which was protecting your younger brother, and instead of protecting him, you killed him. So he rejected the reproof of God. God still speaks. He speaks to us and reproves us through his word and actually through other believers. They're really angels in disguise where they bring up the things that are going to harm us and 
uh, when we reject it, we move into the dark, and sin gets a deeper control over us. Really kind of tragic. So as a result, we reap what we sow. And the thing that I find, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, almost satisfying because it makes a nice, uh, concise, or complete thought, is we often lose the very thing that we desire. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. It's, it's perfectly just. The very thing that you want, you're not going to get. And Cain had a green thumb. You know, basically that was his thing. Everything he, you know, you could, you know, grow tomatoes and, you know, whatever, the wrong soil. Um, but now, instead of having a green thumb, he's got blood-stained hands and the earth rejects him. So the earth was cursed under Adam, but now it gets a specific curse. Cain is not going to be able to grow anything. So God said to him after, he says, my brother's keeper, what have you done? Wow. He's again trying to bring to him confession. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the earth. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be. All his efforts to get um, value is gone. And a fugitive and a vagabond, those were people who were outlaws. A person who is an outlaw is outside the law, both from obeying the law and having the law protect them. So now he's on his own, apart from God. You reap what you sow. Galatians 6, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow, written to believers. And most believers don't believe that. Oh, I can do what I want. I can go after, you know, things that I like. And uh, no consequences. That's Satan's lie. The wicked does deceptive work. In other words, they uh, don't, uh, the word for deceptive, is, or one of these word, words is uh, repayment. Uh, they, they don't get what they think they're going to get. Uh, they, they get something, but it turns to gravel in their mouth. They get something, and it's really bad for them. But whoever sows righteousness will have a sure reward. So um, I asked you down below, what are you sowing? Have you given any thoughts to it? Like, what seeds are you planting? Uh, faithfulness, obedience. Are you doing the things that give you favor in God's sight? Uh, Hosea says, the end, sow for yourselves righteousness and reap according to hesed or covenantal faithfulness. You need to plant the things that are going to spring up as righteous fruit and you will reap that righteous fruit according to God's covenantal promises. And then it goes on, now it's time to seek the Lord. But then it goes on to say, but you're not doing it. Uh, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow, not just what we believe. So Cain says to the Lord, Ah, oh, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. Like, that really mattered? <laughs> I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. So what's he concerned about? Is there any remorse over his... No, he's remorse over the punishment, not over the sin. And it's possible that you know, God's trying to bring him to an awareness of his sin, that if he confessed it, God could have forgiven him. But his basic problem is he's not responding to God's revelation. He's rebelling against God. When God said, if you want to be accepted to do what's right, he rebelled against that. And if he knew God, he would have acknowledged him as God and the Lord of life and probably offered a better thing. But yeah, we mess up. But then when he's told, hey, you're messing up, he goes through with his plan to get rid of Cain. I mean, get rid of Abel. 
Those who rebel against God revile his merited and merciful justice, which results in separation from God and grief. He earned God's disapproval. And yet God is still merciful in his justice. Look what happens. The Lord said, Nah, that's not going to happen. Anyone who kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So this kind of implies there are other people around. Um, so we don't have the exact chronology of uh, Adam and Eve's relationships and kids. We know that Seth is coming. But uh, the Lord basically says, no, uh, I will set a mark on Cain lest anyone finding him should kill him. And Daily Truth basically got one of those warning signs that says, do not kill Cain. <laughs> it was a t-shirt that he used to wear, <laughs> where, do not kill Cain. God. Um, we don't know what the mark is. Everything's kind of conjecture. So uh, the Jews actually thought it was a horn coming out of his head, so he looked really scary and people would avoid him. Um, basically, if he had a horn coming out of his head, they would say, he's a beast, let's kill him and see how he tastes. But, uh, Anyway, uh, God is still merciful in doing that. He lets him live, and he lets him live as an object lesson. Guess what? He's all gonna—he's gonna die in the flood anyway. So you get to chapter six. There's a flood. He dies. But God actually includes some more information for another lesson that we kind of can see, and you don't see this unless you actually do some thinking about the scriptures. Um, defiant disobedience, oh, defiant disobedient, which should be d disobedient, my bad, which are really demonic worshipers get worth and value from men rather than God, and they leave a legacy of ungodliness. And I would have to say that the majority of people who gather for worship, I can say this without a shadow of a doubt, if we include all religions, are not worshiping the God of heaven, they're worshiping the God of earth, which is Satan. And they are, their worship is an affront to God. He even says in Isaiah in the beginning, I wish someone would just close the doors to my temple. You, you guys are just you know, messing up my court, and it's just you know, bogus worship. And you know, if you look at what most people in churches today call worship, it's singing songs without much thought. Just listen to the beat, swaying, you know, free concert. It, it's not worship. It's no response to God's revelation. Uh, God doesn't really enter into it. It's, you know, watching the people up front perform. Um, so disobedient worshipers get worth and value from men rather than God. Let's see how that works. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, and he built a city. Wait a minute. Didn't God just say you're supposed to be a vagabond? And what's he doing building a city? He is still rebelling against God even in his punishment. Wow. So rotten to the core. And then we get, you know, ten, whatever, six uh, or seven verses later, a guy called Lamech. There are a couple Lamechs. One was the father of Noah. A couple... Yeah, you know, it's like the names are confusing, which is why I usually don't pay attention to them. This is the great, great, great grandson of uh, Cain. All right? And it's the only thing that's elaborated upon. You have the genealogies, and then you get this little vignette. Ada and Zillah were his wives. Some people get on his case for being um, polygamous, but then, you know, then what do they do when they get to, you know, Abraham and David and Solomon and you know those other guys, Moses. He says, Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. So he calls them, and then he, it's, a, it's poetic, he repeats who they are. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. I am so much greater and better. Doesn't that smack of pride? It's demonic. Like, this young guy stepped on your foot and you killed him? And now you're boasting about it? That's like, I don't think anybody could say that that's a good thing. 
Let's say we have a tribe of complete savages. And then in contrast to him, so his legacy of king, ungodly guys, I think Nimrod descends from this line, mighty hunter and uh, kind of founder of the mother child cult that is prevalent even up into the time of Jesus. Um, in contrast to the ungodly legacy, we have Seth. Adam knew his wife, and uh, they gave birth to a son, they named him Seth, which means compensation. <laughs> God made it up to him. Um, so remember, uh, <clears throat> God um, promised Eve that her seed would crush Satan's head. So uh, when they get um, Cain, I think his name means gotten. So she was thinking, oh, this is really good. Um, and then when they get uh, Abel, his name is uh, kind of like effervescence, vanity, he's like vapor, and he only lasted a little short time. I don't know how they knew that. But, but here she actually says why he named him. God has appointed an other seed for me instead of, Okay, so they get compensation uh, instead of Abel. Uh, Seth has a son they name Enosh. And then man, men began to call on the name of the Lord. So instead of basically saying how great I am for killing people, we're now calling on the name of Yahweh for help. And then Enoch is the great, great, great grandson of of Seth. And when Enoch comes, we find out that he walked with God and was no more. So when you read in Hebrews, first there's Abel and then there's Enoch. And if you notice, there's a little bit about worship here. You call on the name of the Lord and then you walk with him. And that is responding correctly to Revelation. But um, Cain did not respond to the revelation of God um, inherent in his creatorship, did not respond to the rebuke or reproof that God brought him out, didn't even respond to the uh, rejection correctly. Uh, he just, just failed to respond, rebelled to the end, and left a legacy of people who rebel. Uh, Seth is a godly line, the Messiah comes through him in the genealogies. And people walking after Seth walk with God. So we can have a choice about how we respond. Uh, we need to know God, know who he's re how, how he's, what his revelation is, and then respond correctly to live happily ever after. So the major lesson of this is if you want to be accepted, do what's right and worship God as he desires on his terms. Okay, questions on what I said or what's below? But repent is to change your mind, and that requires a change of values. Confess is to speak the same thing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from unrighteousness written to believers who need to get their act clean, acts cleaned up. It's called the Christian bar of soap. So we need to, when we see stuff in the scripture that says, this is bad, we need to say, yeah, I agree, that's bad. You know, idolatry, seeking after, you know, or blessing from something other than God, bad. It's bad that I do that. I need to not do that anymore. And instead, I repent. I change my mind about my sin and say, that's really not going to get me what I want. And we embrace the new set of values that God has, and then we act in accord with those values. So one of the questions I hear is, uh, how do you change your values? There's a whole sermon on that. Uh, people have been asking me to, to redo that one. But uh, one of these days, maybe I will. So, yeah, we need to be responsive to God, and that, that's what it means to walk with God. To walk with God means he's in front of us, or real close to us, and if he goes left, we go left. If he goes right, we go right. If he stops, we stop. It's just like following the cloud in uh, the wilderness, where when the clouds stop, they stop. And I'm sure there were times when just when they got camp settled, God said, okay, time to move, just to train their will. To respond to him and that's really how parenting is supposed to work you train the kid 
to have a correct response to um, the authority that God has in their life. And our culture lacks emotional control. Pain is a really good uh, vignette of what happens when people don't have emotional control. And then remember when I did the whole series on emotions? Emotions are things that you have manufactured based on the um, your upbringing and things that you've heard and things that you've embraced. And you need to embrace the right stuff. Repentance is a change of mind, not just actions. It's metanoia. Meta is change, noia is mind. And a lot of people think it's repent means just don't do it. But no, you're going to continue to do what's wrong because you always do things according to your values. So you got to change that. Well, there are, at the very end of Revelation, you see the same thing. When the judgment of God comes down upon them, they curse God for judging them, as opposed to you know acknowledging and repenting. Right? They're, they're all children of Cain. It's, it's just amazing that Satan has so warped our minds and values. Fear of God, Christians, good, good Christians will fight against that when I talk with them. Oh, we're not supposed to fear God, we're just supposed to love him. You know, it's like, wow. False teachers have done a phenomenal job, and people are ignorant of the scriptures, and Satan is pleased, and God is grieving. So sad. So, uh, let's see if uh, we can put together the way of Cain. What would you call the way of Cain, based on this little profile of his life, that we're supposed to avoid, so we avoid woe? Rebellion against God's way. Try to get worth and value. Which is pride, yeah. Hmm? Element of pride is, yeah. Humility is, not mine, but thy will be done. Pride is not thine, but my will be done. Yeah, so the false teachers were basically rebelling against God. And remember, that's what it says. They deny his lordship. And then look what happens when you do that. Uh, Cain lost his own brother. He lost uh, fellowship with his family. He lost a uh, relationship with God. And he raises up you know, creature demons. So sad. Okay, time's up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the scriptures to tell us uh, what you're like, we're like, and how our relationship with you should work. We thank you for the good example of Abel and the bad example of Cain. We thank you that you give us a chance to do what's right. Uh, that meditation does not have to rule over us. We can master it. I pray that you would um, help us walk righteously with you, in responsiveness to you, value your reproof, and draw in your grace to do what's right in your sight. For that is what you desire, and that you clearly give us all the help we need to do. Thanks for this time. We pray you bless our afternoon in Christ's name. Amen.